if you're thinking about just what the brain can do, I like using just crazy gnarly examples. I used to work in an Alzheimer's clinic when I was trying to get into medical school. And once in a while, these older folks, they would have dementia. Parts of the brains would literally wither, like the flesh would wither. It's not just the thinking and the electricity. Right. And hidden painting abilities would come out. So, so you see, and I'm not talking like they're going to be at, in, in a museum at some point, but a dramatic change in, their, in the way they wrote, in their ability to paint landscapes. Mm -hmm. And you see the before and after pictures. And those kind of things make me think there's a lot of untapped potential. So those examples, when I, t you know, when I take care of brain injured, it's not all sad cases. Mm. They can be phenomenal in some ways. And you learn that there's so much going on in the brain that we are not seeing on the daily level. So I think there's a lot of potential we haven't, un we haven't tapped into and that we could if we structured things better in our daily lives as also in the ways we approach our kids and the next generations that we we're talking mm. before we got started. Anything difficult where you have to think is good for your brain. If you ask Usain Bolt, how do I get stronger legs? Run. It, it's intuitive. But the flesh in our skulls, it's meant to think and feel. Mm. And that is the power of self-growth. And it's a thinking machine. It's a thinking flesh that you actually have to use or to protect itself because it's an energy hog, right? It's three pounds, but uses 20%. If you're not using parts of it, it'll program itself to let those parts of the garden wither. Mm. So the diversity of thinking and the depth of thinking just one level past what you're used to is the way to keep the whole garden flourishing. And it is a garden in there. There's chemicals, there are things moving, there are different types of brain cells, it's not just neurons. So I always try to give that metaphor analogy, if you will, that it's a garden and you have to irrigate it and stimulate and tend to all the corners, particularly the ones you're starting to neglect. Maybe it's your left hand. Getting out of the box, and engaging the recesses of your mind is the most important thing. And then the creative things happen. You don't just sit down and have them happen. You gotta work and dream and go hard. And on top of that, something creative can happen. Mm. So now we have the understanding that the brain is meant to think. The brain is also meant to command your body to move. And absolutely, the minute you don't use your left hand, the right parietal lobe with the motor strip says, I'm not getting used much. I'll shave down that. I'll shave down that density of those brain cells a little bit. So that's where movement's important. So simple things like getting the mouse, you know, using the mouse with your left hand and using your phone with your left hand. Mm -hmm. It's a powerful technique. And then the other thing is navigation. When you see old people and they lose their way home, well, that has a particular address also. Many things are global in the brain, but navigation is in the temporal lobe and they have dementia in that area. Navigation also is... Uh, spatial awareness is a function of the brain and sometimes when we're on our phones too much we don't have that so my kids I tell them don't look down not religiously or adamantly but try to just remember our route and just look up and see how see how far you can get uh, I think those habits will help us as we get less young and those are practical things we can do during the day and as far as the uh, the other element is brain training it, it doesn't have to be some weird game that's not intuitive. I think brain training just means learning as a habit, mm. one step past where you're comfortable. If you're reading it, you know it, your brain's an, it's an idol. If it's too hard, it's not even engaged. It's, it's, I'm, not, I'm not even gonna win this race. I'm not gonna kick it in second gear. So just, just like video games, just good enough to get to the next level, right? They don't hit you with the fifth level, the tilt level up front. It's level one to level two, level two to level three. And that's what learning is. So despite your knowledge and intellect. It's just that level right beyond you that is brain training. So you mm -hmm. don't have to buy an app. You just have to challenge yourself and think. The way I think habits function, this is just, these are my ideas, is that because it's such an energy hog, it wants to be efficient. So this whole myth about you only use 20% of your brain. No, we use 100% of our brain and pictures show that. But to get things done, we might only use 15. To get something complicated done, we might only use 35. Otherwise, you wouldn't be an efficient animal or a human in the savanna if you couldn't really control this uh, important, but not having, not having it in fifth gear all the time is, is, a, is an evolutionary strategy, in my opinion. So I explained to my kids, okay, so, so then it falls into ruts, because efficiency is about ruts, like dominoes falling in a certain path. And the best way I can explain it is, as you grow, the brain... Uh, the way the electric, electricity flows, the way the connections uh, prioritize, 
is a bit like skiing down a mountain. It starts creating these electrical grooves of sort. If you see something, you see a cliff, fear. It goes down a certain mm -hmm. path. And every time you do that and you've reinforced it, it actually becomes less expensive energy-wise to follow and fall into that habit. So these pathways, these habits in our mind, these rituals, these things that uh, are good for us, we want to hold on to those. But a lot of them have become deeply carved you know, mm -hmm. routes down the mountain. And filling those in, burying them, and finding healthier ones is going to be an energy expending process. The effort will be harder in the beginning. And then as you create a new route down the mountain, you can condition yourself to having more favorable and constructive responses. That's the best way I can explain is why effort will lead to change and your most effort will be spent in the beginning. And then you can change your emotional and cognitive responses by conditioning yourself to find a different, different route down the mountain. You were born with more brain cells than, uh, as a kid than you are as an adult. You were equipped with a lot that we can't hold on to. You're going to reinforce the ones that you're using and the ones you don't use, your brain will say, I don't need to hold on to them because they're just using energy. We start off with more brain cells than we hold on to, yet we get smarter and we get more coordinated. As we lose brain cells, they're, they're exam that's the example that shows you that uh, it's about the connections and reinforcing those mm. patterns. I hope that empowers people to be like, wait a second, it's not a static thing. Mm. And much I would like I would exercise for my body, there are things maybe I should do for my brain and mind, especially while the window is still here, uh, to set those into actions and make them constructive habits and maybe pass them on to the generation. What that are follow. you calling that window? You know, I would say that window is less than 40, less than 30 even, is, a, is the most bang for your buck. There's no doubt that the ability is highest in your teens. And that's actually when you get a lot of mental health disorders. It's a weird thing. The most dynamic shape-shifting is in adolescence. So we come into our identity, but we also, it's also a, a peak of mental health issues. So you're sort of setting your, your cognitive and emotional thermostat. And then 20s and 30s and 40s and 50s, it does, it does slow down, but it doesn't wither to zero. Let's talk about the mind diet. Yeah. I found that really interesting in the book. Yeah, that's well known. So this is not to lose weight. It's what nutrients to put inside you, where if you have a thousand people here and you have a thousand people here, and for 20 years they eat differently, what are the numbers of people with dementia, mm -hmm. all of the things being equal? It essentially says, it doesn't have to be Mediterranean. It just has to be plants, like, as I tell my kids, plants, which is you know, fruit or salad. It doesn't have to be just salad. You know, yogurt, nuts, lean meats like you know, chicken and salmon. What it's is the, it that salmon has? Omega-3s. It's the only thing in our literature that we know is a, is a nutritional component in food that is good for brain health. And the omega-3s are a unique type of fat that are, you know, the brain is an extremely fatty organ. And so it needs to, it needs to have those fats. What you can't have is a lot of fried processed food. And if you have a cheat day or whatever, or you have a burger, it doesn't negate what you've done. I think that's the hardest thing about dieting for people. They feel like the shift has to be complete and religious. And to me, it's more glacial because the benefits will also take decades to accrue. Those are the nutrients that are best for the brain. Chemicals in plants have perfect locks for which they serve the keys in our bodies. We, we grew with the plants. Mm. We changed with the plants. We use the plants to our advantage. And now the, the plants and the food have, have gone the other way and it's a disadvantage for us because we're eating too much. So before food scarcity was uh, an advantage because it kept us from, it was intermittent fasting by, you know, by necessity. Yeah. I think it makes intuitive sense also that just a little bit, and with all respect, I know people can't get food throughout the world, I've traveled the world, I know there's bad food everywhere, but on an intellectual level, for people trying to take it to the next level, is a bit of food scarcity can actually sharpen your mind. Mm -hmm. And neuroscience is trying to understand at the molecular level what's going on, what's swimming into the brain, and which receptors are being turned on. But I think, 
I think it does make some intuitive sense.